Rebic, Rafa, tira, gol! Raffaele Leo! Oggi segna Leo! La mia giornata è iniziata così! Oggi se... Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sempre Milan podcast. I'm your host, Oli Fisher, joined once again by Anthony Torgrud. What's up guys, glad to be back. Um, we originally had Gian with us. And then uh, his internet provider decided to do maintenance in his area right as we started. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's no longer with us. And Madison is at a doctor's appointment. He's still alive. I mean, you say he's no longer with us. That is a bit yeah. sinister. He's still all right. And actually, he's doing very well because we must. Well, I don't know. No, we can't, can we? I don't know. Can we? I have no, no idea. We'll wait. Let's wait. Yeah. We can do it when he's next on. Anyway. There's something to congratulate him for, but uh, we'll wait and he can announce it. Um, but yeah, troublesome to some instead then. Um, and and we just got to plow on, haven't we? International break. Um, are you enjoying the international break? Do you ever enjoy the international break? Um, this one I did, actually. I actually went out of my way to watch an international game today for the first time in uh, a long time, I think, since like the euros and that was not even break that was just a summer but i watched usa versus mexico world cup qualifier um that's always a fun one and of course usa won two zero um we've beat them three times in a single calendar year the first time one of the teams has ever done that uh well since like 1936 so as far as i'm concerned the first time uh, because i think the u.s men's national team was made in like 1934 so i don't can't really count that first one but yeah, so we won again. Um, that's great. And uh, Portugal might miss out on the World Cup. Italy might miss out. Sweden might miss out. So a lot of big names probably missing, but USA won't be one of them this year. So mm, yeah, We didn't qualify for the record. Like, I'm not saying we already did. We have a lot more games to go, but yeah. we might as well have at this point. It's going to be interesting, those playoff rounds for the European uh, area of qualifying, because mm-hmm. there's some big teams that are going to be involved. And yeah. I will say I was really impressed with Serbia. Yeah. Um, when they beat Portugal, thought they were, they were superb um, and actually deserved to top that group. Um, but yeah, England play tonight, San Marino, so it's going to be a cricket score, probably. Famous last words. Um, uh, yeah, San Marino's we're, first we're, ever victory. <laughs> I think we're already in, basically, with a with a win tonight. Um, so that's all good. And then we'll see what happens in Qatar. I'm just not gassed for the Qatar World Cup at all. You know, I really we, dislike the winter up thing. The season and and it being at an unusual time and the time difference meaning that like the late games are three pm over here. It's just hard to get as excited for it as it was the Euros, for example, or like the Brazil World Cup. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, so cool. And depending on where Milan's at in the table, come next mm. next winter, like a big break like that might either kill our momentum or it could help us if we're, we're struggling, you know, but mm. um, I don't know. I'm just thinking about it in terms of like, if Sweden do qualify, Zlatan said he wants to play that world cup. So that means one more year of renewal for him. And we already know that he's probably on the decline and at 41 years old, maybe it'll be a steep decline. We don't know yet, but um, to have him do his world cup in December and then have to play another half season is kind of a, a pain if he's not our our main guy at that point but i mean i guess that's a year year away so we'll find out when mm. we get there yeah um we should mention actually some of the perform there's still some games to come because uh, we're recording this on the monday and um th- yeah there are still some some games to come in this current international break but um it seems as though like i don't know that milan has taken a step forward in international reputation because mm. all of a sudden We've got Rafa Leal being called up for the Portuguese senior national team. Teo obviously keeping his spot. Tonali um, and Pobega, who's at lo- on loan at Torino, getting called up for the Italy squad. Uh, Brahim Diaz for the Spain squad. Uh, Teo Hernandez actually got two assists yeah. in that win over Kazakhstan. So um, the lads are firing and it's great to see. We actually had 14 internationals in total who were called up for their country. And I think mm-hmm. it's a good sign because I remember... At times in the last couple of years, we've had nobody go to the Italy squad, which is always a bad sign because Italy spine in the past has kind of always featured Milan players. Um, but just those those other guys, the young lads like Brahim, like Liao, like Teo, who perhaps were just looking to take that next step in terms of recognition for their country, have taken the next step. Um, Tamori should be in as well. There's no two ways about it. I'm angry that England haven't picked him, but Southgate likes to drip feed players into the international setup and he likes to kind of rotate them in. So I think that when it comes to it, he'll be back in. Because yeah, hopefully on, he's in for the World Cup. On form-wise, he's he's probably England's best centre-back at the moment. Um, yeah. So I think it's almost a clear strategy. He's played a lot of football. Just to just to protect him a little bit, um, while 
you know, Mings and Cody, yeah, they shouldn't be in there, but also they kind of need playing into form if they're going to be options moving forward. So it's annoying, but it is what it is. I'm not worried about uh, anything short, medium term. He'll be he'll be back in the fold. Um, but yeah, it's just good to see. Good to see um, our name being mentioned so much again. Um, yeah, whenever it is nice. there's, a, there's an international game on um, and there's a Milan player featured, it's nice to watch with a little bit of, you know, actual enjoyment and thinking what's going to do. Um, so long may that continue because it can only help the players from a confidence standpoint. And we, we talked about it before with Teo Hernandez, how he might think that he needs to move club in order to finally get that France call up. Well, that's been disproven. Um, mm-hmm. And now Brahim Diaz will be thinking, oh, maybe I don't have to go back to Real Madrid to, to achieve my dream of playing for Spain. Right. Um, you know, Leal will be really happy to be playing alongside um, his childhood idol, Cristiano Ronaldo and all that. So, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Positive stuff. And hopefully uh, between now and when we next record, there's some more goals and assists to talk about from our lads on international duty. Um, but yeah, what should we do first? Fiorentina preview or discuss some rumours? Um, let's do some rumours first. We'll, we'll yeah. end it on Fiorentina. Keep it relevant. So, um, Roman Ferva has gone militant. Is probably the, uh, the main rumour that we've got to talk about over the last week. Um, we know that we were extensively linked with him during the summer transfer window. We know that he wanted to come to us. Um, he went about that in perhaps the wrong way from a professionalism standpoint because he refused to show up for the bus to to get to a Brest away game. That obviously angered Brest, as you would expect, and uh, they pulled him off the market, which meant that we didn't get our man. We went for Junior Messias instead. Um, but now he's decided to randomly, just as the rumours were starting to resurface ahead of the January window, we're only a month and a half away from that now, uh, he's decided to do an interview with La Gazzetta Deo Sport where he talks about um, how he's still charmed by Paolo Maldini's phone call that he got. He's spoken to Fodor Balotore God, I can never say his name. Fodor Balotore about what Milan is like because they were teammates at Monaco. Um, he's said that it's important when you move to a club like Milan that you do preparation. He was talking about it like it was pretty much a done deal and he would be arriving. Yeah, so I, it made me laugh when I saw this interview because I think it was either last week or the week prior. You had said, you know, props to him. He, he's uh, just keeping his head down, playing well, and he's not making any trouble. And then he went and made trouble. Um, the, the club said it was moment. it was uh, unauthorized. And um, yeah, so he's probably going to get in trouble for that, of course, it, as he should, to be honest with you. And uh, then Milan came out and said, uh, we're not... We're not interested. Like we're not we're not doing this. So yeah. um yeah, I mean it's one thing to, you know, compliment a club. It's another thing to, you know, compliment them and be like, Yeah, I'd love to move there or whatever, but he's not going about it that way, you know, and, and this looks disrespectful for both clubs. Not that he's saying anything negative about Milan, but from their point of view, why would they want to bring in a player who who goes rogue in, in the media to get the moves he wants? You know, I mean, if some if you were to come to us and something were to happen to where um I don't know. There's really no bigger club, but like a Real Madrid wanted him or something. And, and he decided that's his ultimate goal. Who's to say he wouldn't do this exact same thing to us. And, and Milan mm-hmm. doesn't want that. So um, I, I think he's putting himself in a corner and it's not going to end well for him. I, I don't think he's going to get, get the move. I can totally understand this. Milan have distanced themselves from it in a, in an official capacity because they don't want to be seen to be associated with tapping up a player. Let's mm-hmm. say um, there have been reports from some reliable sources that we've remained in contact with the agent of Father and, and um, you know, that in once January comes around, we could submit another official bid. Uh, I find it interesting that now the narrative is, you know, we don't have any interest. Um, and Di Marzio, for example, is saying we're actually looking at other targets. But who knows, that might just be to calm the storm a little bit. Um, you know, it's, we're still six weeks away. Uh, the anger can die down again. Um, and, and maybe we do actually end up getting him still. Who knows? That is the, the twists and turns. But um, it, it's just strange, isn't it? And, and it's it's tough to defend him when he's doing something like that, especially yeah. with it being an unauthorised interview. Um, and to speak as if the move is already complete, you know, is, is bizarre if it's not true. Um, so I, I honestly do not know 
what to make of it. And I would be interested to know as well, because we've spent so much time looking at, at how further might fit into this team. Um, I'd be interested to know what the actual alternative targets are, if there are any, because it feels like we've spent so much effort trying to get this guy um, that nobody knows any other names. Um, so, yeah. That's not necessarily a bad thing, though. Like, um, no. you know, Milan does this often where w- there's no mention of something, then surprise, we, we, we signed this guy or someone's got a medical or like, you, you know, you just you hear about it at the tail end of the, the transfer saga. And so I'm sure there are other targets. We've had multiple targets for each position we've gone to. It's just, you only get one of them, so I, I wouldn't be shocked if another person arrives, but I also wouldn't be shocked if he arrives. Uh, mm. It could go either way. Yeah, and at least we know that if he does arrive, that he's well up for it, um, and he, you know, he's really looking forward to the challenge of making mm-hmm. a step up to a big club like us. I do kind of like his attitude in that sense. Um, he actually spoke... If you imagine that that interview was done after the move has been completed, or as he just landed for his medical or whatever, he actually says all the right things about right, yeah, yeah. versatility, about working hard, um, about you know being called by Maldini and all that stuff that would have actually endeared him to the fans straight away. But instead, we're kind of left scratching our heads and, and wondering what kind of a game he's trying to play here. Um, especially with January, not it's not exactly yeah. just around the corner. It's interesting because you think about it like imagine a scenario where you're in his shoes. You know, say you're a, a fresh, hot, young talent, and obviously you want to play for Milan. That's your favorite club. So you're trying to force those moves, but is that the way you would go about doing it? Would you make these interviews where the only club I want to play for is Milan, not the one I'm at, blah, 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 all this stuff, you know, us as fans, we think like, yeah, do whatever you can get, get the move, get to it. But Mm. it's probably not the right way to go about it. You're going to ruffle a lot of feathers along the way. And then if you flop, it's even worse, you know, I think, um, I'd have loved to have been in the room when Maldini and Masara discovered that he'd done that interview. Or yeah. like be in that WhatsApp chat. I bet I bet the reaction was, oh shit. Like or, or it was, hey, the... give this interview. Let's uh Yeah, well <laughs> we could yeah. happen. Maybe, maybe they're playing it too, you know. Again, the official line is that the the club didn't know anything about the interview. Um, right. they didn't know it was gonna happen, but they're obviously gonna say that, aren't they? I mean, mm-hmm. who knows what goes on in these private conversations with agents like this might be them saying, Let's give give the dice a roll and see what happens if you yeah, this exactly. Interview. Um but yeah, we'll see what happens. That seems like one to either monitor or if, if the official line is still that we're not interested in a week, then um, it's funny. One of the other targets that has been mentioned by multiple sources is Noah Lang, who plays at Club Bruges at the moment um, and has been good in the Champions League, it must be said. Um, he's 22 years old, but he has the complete opposite approach to these transfer links. He just came out and said, I don't really care about big clubs. Yeah. He's just not bothered, you know. He's saying it's. He's not even said that he's flattered to be linked with them. He's just like, I'm not bothered. Um, so I can't yeah. really respect that. I think bit. that's great too, you know, for his current club. That that shows mm-hmm. like, look, we got to dedicate a player who just wants to put his head down and play play ball, you know. Um, but I don't know. I think maybe it's a bit too much because when a club like Milan or a Real Madrid or a Barcelona or like a, a big club show interest in you, like. And you say I don't really care, you know? Then, mm-hmm. then maybe they'll be like, "Who are you compared to us?" Like, okay, we don't need you then if you don't care. So, yeah, I think you mm-hmm. got to play both sides a little bit. Um, I would lean more towards what Noah's doing as opposed to what Roman's doing, but mm-hmm. still say like, oh, "I love the interest. That's that's so great that a, a big club like that's recognized me." But happy where I'm at. I just want to play football. You know, I love mm-hmm. my club. That's that would be the perfect mixture, I think. Yeah, but that's yeah. also very media scripted. That it's what you expect players to say too. So, you know, it goes both ways. I fully understand why people would be annoyed by a very PC answer like that. You know, yeah, it's so sanitized now in football. Mm-hmm. Interviews from players they just seem to have zero personality at all. Yeah, I just think to the Kane saga over the summer when it by not showing up for training, he, he was basically saying that he wanted to move, and yet he gives this diplomatic answer when he finally returns to training. Yeah. Like, that wasn't the case at all. I'm fully committed to Spurs. It's like, nah, mate, just just upset the apple cart. Just say what we all want you to say. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you hate it there. Um, yeah. So we'll see. Roman Furthers either coming or not. Um, I hope that he doesn't do another interview like that because it won't yeah. have his chances. Let's put it that way. Um, and the other rumour that we should talk about, which has emerged really in the last 24 hours, um, is Renato Sanchez. Now, at the moment, it's it's mainly Gazette Adeo Sport who are saying that um, he's the guy that we've chosen to become Kessier's replacement. Um, and it sounds pretty good. We're in pole position. 
um, as per that report. Uh, Arsenal also wanted him. Liverpool and Wolves have been linked from, from the Premier League. Uh, worth noting that Lille aren't having as good a season. Uh, they lost their mm -hmm. manager, Christophe Gaultier, uh, to Nice over the summer. Obviously, they won the league last season. And this season, they're kind of languishing in mid-table. I think they're actually in the bottom half. Um, so, I think, you know, Renato's form might have suffered a little bit for that. Um, but there was, you know, no doubt that he was the best player on the pitch, in my opinion, when when um, they came to our place last season in the Europa League and beat us 3-0. Um, he absolutely ran the game. So, it was quite an interesting link. Yeah, it is. Um, and we've been link linked with him multiple seasons past year. Um, I think since about 16-17. Maybe, maybe even sooner than that, uh, or later than that, I mean. Um, we've been linked with him plenty. He's a great player, um, and as I'm sure everyone's seen on Twitter, everyone's really excited about this, but I say no, and it, it's the injuries, to be completely honest. You, you know, you look at Milan's record with injuries this season, last season, every season. It's just, it's a nightmare of injuries, and going down his, you know, in 16-17, he only missed five games for Bayern Munich, but he got lucky with the timing of that. I mean, he had a hamstring injury that had him out for 58 days and that was only, only three games. Then he had, you know, some other stuff, but then on top of that, you go 17, 18 and he was out four times missing a total of 25 games, all hamstring injuries. Uh -huh. And then the season after that was out 11 days with an ankle injury, missed two games season. After that, he had three more hamstring injuries, missed a total of, let's see, Got to do some math. Fifth, 12 games. Uh -huh. And then the season after that, he had one, two, three, four more hamstring injuries. Missed 12 games. And then this season alone, he's already missed 13 games. Again, muscle injury, thigh problem, hamstring, meniscus. Yeah. I mean, and we have hamstring injuries often here, so we obviously don't know how to treat them. You want to bring in a guy who's only 24 and has had two pages worth of hamstring injuries on transfer market. It doesn't make sense to me. Not not for the money that he's gonna cost because he's this wonder kid. I mean, if we get him on a free, sure, but then we're that means we're losing Kessie on a free, and then it's bad business all around. Personally, I don't think he is a, a good replacement. I don't think he's better than Kessie. I mean, yeah, he's twenty four. This guy's the limit. But again, with all these hamstring injuries that date back to nineteen years old, I mean. Do, do you ever really get full fitness after that? It's it's not a good look for us, and I, I think there's other options that may not be the same talent ceiling as Renato Sanchez, but it there's probably safer bets in there. I mean, you look at where we're at right now. Calabria just picked up a knock on international break, and now now we're looking at Kalu and Fiorentina and Atletico, which, you know, props to him. He, he's been able to hold down the fort, but we're just going through all these things, and Kessie, up until this season, never missed a game for us. Mm. And now we want to replace him with an extremely injury prone player who's a downgrade on his ability. It just, it doesn't make sense. Guess he's our number sure. one guy. So just because we have four or five midfielders doesn't mean, you know, you, you don't replace midfielder one with midfielder six and it, say it's good just because you got numbers. Mm. So I, I'm not, I'm not okay it with it. It would be an investment as well. He's under contract until 2023, which means that come next summer, they'd still be able to command a decent fee. Mm -hmm. um, whoever, whoever ends up getting him is taking a massive gamble on his fitness because when you have that many separate muscle problems, it's safe to call it chronic at that mm -hmm. age, you know, because yeah. he's so young. Um, well, in a club like Bayern Munich picked him up, who have one of the best medical teams in the world. I mean, you see all those players' transformations. And they kept yeah. him for a season and sent him to Swansea where he just got hurt endlessly. They took him back for one more season and he got hurt again. And they just said, well, we can't do this. And they got rid of yeah, him. I mean, the 18, 19 season that you mentioned where he missed two games, you think, oh, fair enough. But he barely ever played. And Bayern were, were looking for a buyer. Um, yeah. They paid 35 mil plus 10 mil bonuses to sign him. And I mean, he must go down as one of their recent flops in terms of return on investment. And they rarely get it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, there's clearly so much talent there with him. Yeah. Uh, for the Portuguese national team, you see it. He does a fantastic job. But I don't even think that, let's say you do get him, and let's say he does give you 30-plus games a season. I don't even think he's a light-for-light -light replacement for Kessie at no. all. If anything, he's done a better job as a box-to-box. -box. So then you start thinking, well, do you move someone back? Do you, do you have Tenali trying to replace Kessie? Because if anything, we've seen best from him when he's mm -hmm. given more of a you know typical Metzala role. Um, and I'd, I just... Something doesn't really add up to me. I think 
Um, it's potentially that kind of journalism that comes around in the middle of the international break where yeah. they're looking for something to fill the papers and they think, well, this guy's a hot topic at the moment. He's doing well for his country. Let's associate him with, with Milan. And, and they know we've been close back. a few times, so it, it's a real easy yeah. rumor to sell. They're like, oh, they're back in for him. You know, We've seen it a million times over. A lot of... Um, a lot of football at a young age. That's one thing I will say about him. He, he broke in at Benfica as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, when you go to Bayern, it, it'll either make you or break you as well. So um, understand that. And who knows, it might be that he's turned a corner when it comes to injuries, but we cannot afford to take a risk like that when we're trying to replace someone of Kessie's importance and magnitude. Um, which brings me on to my next point. Um, the guy that I really want to replace him um, there's been plenty of links. Bubakar Kamara is the guy that keeps being talked about a lot. Um, I like Kamara from the very brief bits that I've seen of him, but more because he seems like a, a good fit from, an, from a tactical and an economic point of view. I mean, he'd be a free transfer to replace a free transfer. But I think he'd probably be the most raw out of the players that we've been linked with because he's only 21 years old um, and he's played in Liga um, you know, since he came through at Marseille. Um, so there'd be a period of adaptation to account for there. Um, but the, the one that I, we did recently get linked, but um, it wasn't by a very credible source. And I can't understand why we aren't being linked more is Dennis Zakaria, who's at Munch and Gladbach at the moment. Um, he's 24, so he's the same age as Kessier. Um, he's got Champions League experience because Munch and Gladbach have been a hell of a team over the last few seasons. Um, I remember watching him against Inter in the Champions League and thought, you know, he looked absolutely fantastic. Um, he would also be a free transfer because his contract's expiring. The Bundesliga is obviously a better league competitive-wise than Liga. Um, also, Munch and Gladbach play a press-oriented system, just like we do. Um, he's used to playing in a double pivot. You know, they've switched a little bit to a 3-4-2-1 this season, but he's still playing as a defensive midfield duo. Um, so I, I think he looks like a really good fit and I can't understand why we haven't been more seriously linked. Um, but yeah, I think, um, Madison touched on it either last week or the week prior, but you know, it, you could keep finding the diamonds in the rough, but eventually you're going to get it wrong. And if mm. we want to do well in the champions league, which is our ultimate goal, we need to get players that have done well in the champions league. We need to get players with more experience. And I think that's kind of a knock on, um, this guy <laughs> because yeah. i mean obviously they, they beat inter i think they made it to the round of 16 last year um but yeah. one season isn't isn't really top top experience i mean it's better than nothing but and, and i think that's probably why renato sanchez comes in because he's at least a name even though he really hasn't played much in the champions league i mean he did it for or he's doing it for Lille this season if he ever gets fit he didn't do it much for Bayern, but he was on that squad um and i, I don't think anywhere else he he had it so he's got a little bit um and Kamara is kind of green. Like you said, he, he would be the rawest of the three. Um, I do like that the most simply because I, I think Hesse's probably going to leave on a free. And then, you know, that, that at least saves us from having to splash money on, on someone who's not quite as good. Um, I'm just looking really at, at Zakaria. His market value is 30 million euros. Um, and, and that's good. That's a, know. that's a solid price. You know, I don't know if that's a fair figure. Um, I'd be lying if I said I'd watched much Mucci and Gladbach games. I really don't. So I, it's hard for me to say, yes, this is the guy, or no, this ain't it, you know? But yeah, he, uh, he, at, least he is as well an out, at least he is as well an out and out defensive midfielder, um, mm -hmm. which I think it makes more sense for us to go after someone who's a similar tactical profile than try shoehorn like Renato Sanchez into that role and, and watch him struggle. I think we'd be setting him up to fail. Um, just looking here at his um, injuries, uh, nothing for the last two seasons, really. Um, he missed a game for COVID um, in August this year. Um, he did have a he did have a an MCL injury, but only missed one game, um, and then he missed a fair chunk of of the ninth twenty nineteen twenty season with a with a knee injury. It just says knee injury, so might be. Oh, that's probably the MCL. Ever. That would yeah probably, yeah I'm sure yeah, it blends together. Um yeah I don't know um, let us know in the comments anyway who who you think the most natural replacement for Kessier is um, the guy who first broke the Renato Sanchez news a guy called Rudy Galletti um, works for Sport Italia um, he also mentioned two other names as part of that article and one of them was Vitinia um, who plays at Porto and he was on loan at Wolves last season. 
Um, and he seems to be a bit of a bench midfielder for Porto at the moment. So that doesn't really catch my eye. But the other guy he said was Paulinha, who's um, a defensive midfielder for Sporting. And, you know, I haven't watched him extensively. I'd be lying if I said that I did. But having had a look at his profile, he seems that he would at least fit in terms of a um, from a tactical point of view. Um, but we'll see if anything develops on that front. Yeah, um, I always get nervous buying from Portuguese clubs. They always have like really exorbitant transfer fees, um, or at least release clauses, and then they, they always want to work down. But, you know, when the bar is set that high at the beginning, and I don't know what either of theirs are, I'm sure it's 60, 70 million release, and then they would argue down to like 30, 35 maybe. And it's, uh, I don't know. I just feel like that's, it's always a lot of money. It's a gamble to take a player from that league um, because it really is a, a three club league you know two three club and only one of them gets to play champions league a year so you never really know mm. what kind of quality you're getting out of it you know if you're beating a lower lower table um portuguese side how does that translate to playing in in a top league i don't know that i i think he's plucked those figures out of thin air but i look at paulinho's release clause in his new deal and it's 60 million euros but apparently they're willing to negotiate from 35 so that is yeah. literally exactly what you just said. Yeah, every time. Um, dude. It's, yeah, it's, like, it's a different name, it's, but it's the point. same story every time. Every yeah, single time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll see. And then in terms of other things to address in January, I don't know. Realistically, I think the strike of things not going to happen. Um, I think we're going to proceed how we are. Uh, with the centre forwards, and then it's like if we can get in a guy who can play attacking midfielder and as a right winger, then that is absolutely ideal. Mm-hmm. What happens with Afcon if we if we feel the need to bring in another fielder alone or something? Again, that remains to be seen. Um, there was something from um, Milan News last night, um, an editorial from Pietro Massara, who said that um, Maldini Massara's intention is only to make purchases if they're absolutely necessary. And otherwise, they'll operate on a one-out, one-in policy. So if Castillo leaves, then we'll sign a replacement winger. I think we definitely need a forward. You know, we definitely need someone who can play as a ten or as a right winger. Um, that that is one thing that's. Uh, I, I know what the line is going to be that Messias is like a new signing, um, and I, I I don't disagree with that. I think he's going to be useful if he can stay fit between now and the end of the season. But he doesn't want to play Castillo. Mm. So yeah. we need someone to back up for the right wing. And for, you can say Florenzi, yes, but we don't know how he's going to be after his knee injury. Um, it, it's clear to see that, you know, we've been we've been a little bit thin on depth in the attacking department to the extent that Krunic was pretty much guaranteed a starting spot. Mm-hmm. Um, for yeah, it's interesting while. because we were we were pretty thin, like you said, and yet we're still getting results, you know? So mm-hmm. so the argument on there end is like, do we need another attacker? We're, we're still winning. We're still scoring goals, you know? Rebic has been able to play winger, center forward. Plus, we got Zlatan. Plus, we got Giroud. Liao's been doing bits, you know. And then Krunic didn't do bad when he was in attacking mid. Obviously, that's not the position he should be in. We all know that he shouldn't be there, but he he played his part well, you know. And, and we didn't suffer because of it. Um, I mean, even without the Roshanu in net, like we we haven't lost a game with him outside of Champions League, which we didn't win any with Mignon either. So um, I, I don't think it's been that big of a switch up. And if it's a only necessary transfers, then it would just be replacing Kessie because I I don't believe he's going to renew in January. I think if he's at AFCON, that's it. We're we're done talking to him. You know, if he, he doesn't accept a deal by the end of next month, December, before the window opens, he's gone. We're going to stop. You know, we, we saw that interview with uh, Di Marzio, which I think is actually kind of bullshit, um, where he said Donnarumma wanted to um, play the Atlanta game, see if we we're going to get Champions League, and then he wanted to sign that deal if we called him the next day, but he was told the day before that game that we'd already signed Mignon and that he was done with us, which I don't necessarily believe. I think we we even gave it a, a week or two after that to to try and get it done, and you know the interviews at that point were saying the exact opposite of what the Marzio was saying, so I don't believe that for one bit. Um, I think if they don't agree to the, our prices by December, that's the deadline we've set for for every player for their renewals. Um, they're gone, and that's that's that. Interesting, because the the Donnarumma thing it didn't add up to me because Donnarumma since given interviews where he said that he made his own decision to leave the club and he wanted to try a new challenge and he thanked the club. So someone's lying. Um, either Di Marzio has it right or Donnarumma was lying through his teeth and he actually wanted to stay 
Um, the, the whole thing about him crying after the Atlanta game, I, I just don't remember it. I, I never saw him cry. I, I, Maybe it was in the locker room or something. He didn't cry on the field. No, but, uh, potentially. But also that doesn't add up because if if he's saying that he would have gone the next day to Casa Milan and signed a contract, but he already knew at that point that he was being pushed out of the door, hence why he cried. Uh, I, I don't know. I just... I think there's some overlapping narratives there that, that don't well, quite... Yeah, well, and I think the person feeding the the interview to Di Marzio and the person who's feeding the quotes to Donnarumma, Raiola, who is now seeing his client not getting the play time at PSG. Donnarumma said he was... What disturbed. would he say? He was disturbed by his yeah, lack of playing time. Like, very strange quota- quotation. And uh, it, it all is very indicative of Raiola doing his thing. So maybe he's trying to get that other move, you know? Maybe now that he's at PSG and he's not playing, Raiola thinks maybe we could get an actual transfer fee. He could get some agent fees out of this. Um, I, I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. He's not our player, but I think Raiola is the, the one feeding him. wonder how everyone's going to react when Mignon re-injures his wrist and we sign Donnarumma on loan for the rest of the season. I'm not. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, yeah, rumours uh, done, I guess, isn't it? Um, Fiorentina is the next game. Um, I'm going to have to get up Fiorentina's season so I don't quote any incorrect statistics. But Fiorentina seem like they're a bit of a problem again. Um, they, they certainly I, they're on and off. In an, yeah, they, they are on and off. Um, I have been impressed by what I've seen from them. They absolutely bullied Inter for like the first half of that mm-hmm. game, but then ended up losing 3-1. That's one that sticks out in the memory from when I thought, wow, Fiorentina are serious to them yeah. being like, ah, they, they've got the same old problems. They hired Vincenzo Italiano from Spezia to be their new manager. Really good coach, as we know. I mean, he caught, he, he basically out-coached purely in mm-hmm. the second half of last season when we lost at Spezia. But you're right, they're, they're so on and off that they're alternating yeah. wins and losses and have done for the last five games. Um, yeah, and, and you know, a few of those are, are pretty hard done, like you mentioned. They played well against Inter and then lost. I thought they were the better team against Napoli until they they obviously lost that game as well. And uh-huh. same this past week against uh, or the week prior against Juve, yeah, they, uh, they, yeah. they lost that game, but they were leagues better. You know, uh-huh. they just got unlucky to concede. So, if anything, there's um, you know hope for us because they clearly are leaky at the back. Their defense isn't as strong as it should be, but they're very strong up front. Vlahovic is again scoring hat tricks. You know, almost uh, every other time he goes out there, he's he's man's a killer. So. Uh, I wouldn't say it's an easy game, especially with. Well, no, no, Taylor's back, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's that's a plus. Um, Calabria out is scary because that makes Salamakers effectively useless um, without the overlapping from Davide. He's just not going to do anything. So I think our right side's really going to struggle. Uh, we're going to do most of our attacks on the left as per usual, I think, and that's going to be where you know where, where chances are made. But yeah, it's an interesting, interesting one. Um, I'm not not a hundred percent confident, to be honest with you. Mm. One thing that I, I must actually say about Fiorentina heading into this game is that they are in absolute crisis. Um, Milenko, at the back, this is Milenkovic and Martinez Cuarta, who are their two starting centre backs, are both suspended for the game, um, which is a problem. Uh, Nastasic is out with an injury, so that's not good. Um, Nicolas Gonzalez, who has been has been good so far this season for them, has tested negative for COVID nineteen, but is apparently still struggling. Um, for fitness Mm. Uh, so that's not good and then there was a a thing and I can't remember the names Um, who is it it's no I can't remember the names but essentially because of international call-ups and because of injuries um, and the suspensions the uh, Italiano has like two defenders to work with over the international break um, so he's slotting in midfielders at centre back and wingers at full back during training drills and stuff, and uh, it, it's not the best preparation for a game. Let's be honest. Um, and there's no doubt in that you know if they've been leaky anyway so far this season, mm-hmm. which they have. Um, what are they on? They're on. They're on uh, Four goals players. conceded. Yeah. Um, yeah, in in the table. Um, so it's, they've not drawn yet. Six wins, six losses. Well. Right? Um, then, yeah, it's going to be more problematic for them mm-hmm. uh, in terms of solving their, their issues at the back if they don't have either of their two starting centre-backs. That leads me to a look, to be a little bit more confident about this game. Um, I don't know why, but... No, I think it should. I mean, if imagine we went into a game without our starting two centre-backs. We oh, had yeah, to play yeah. Gabia and 
I don't even know who else do we have. <laughs> Who's our fourth center back? Kalulu uh, slots in a center back. Yeah, 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 exactly. Something like that. And then yeah. have, you know, Teo out and um, Balatore in or something. Like, plus Tata yeah. Rushanu. That's that's something that we're all going to be like, okay, it's a little, a little shaky, a little nervous. Um, yeah. So, personally for me, uh, and this might be controversial, I start Liao on the wing with Rebic up top. I think they're fast enough. They're... They're dirty, not dirty, but you know they they're what's the word I'm looking for? They're they're kind of in your face, um, and I, I think they'll be able to gritty. Yeah. gritty. Thank you. Yeah, they're they're gritty enough to really beat defenders um, at the back there. With Teo, we're going to be screaming for fouls left and right. So, um, yeah, with a, a fast overlapping partnership like Rebic Leal up top, I think we could really do some work. And then later on in the game, we'll probably be up by two or something like that. Bring on Zlatan and uh, slow it down a bit, and you know still be still be a threat. We certainly look more fluid um, when Leal and Rebic play, and mm-hmm. I think that could be important against a makeshift back four, yeah. Fiorentina or back three, however they choose to go with it. Um, my theory on how it's actually going to be is is that he might play the players that um, are freshest. So, obviously, Rebic didn't go for Croatia. Giroud didn't um, get called up by France. So, it could be Rebic on the left, Giroud up front. Um, Brahim Diaz is going to come back without too many minutes played, um, so he should still be relatively okay to start as the attacking midfielder. Salamakas has obviously been away with Belgium, but out of necessity, he's going to start on the right wing. Um, and then for the midfield, I'd, we'll see. Um, the back four kind of picks itself because Balotelli is also injured. Um, he's done his muscle while he's been with Senegal, so that's not good. Um, but it'll be Teo. Kalulu was the fullbacks, and then most likely going to be um, Tamari. In, but Tamari's absolutely in because he didn't get called up by England. And probably um, Romagnoli for the same reason. Cause yeah, potentially. Pierre did get called up, and he played, I believe. And he, he captains, and he plays every minute that he can for Denmark. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that could be that could be the shout. Um, but we'll see. I'm sure more team news will come out between now and Saturday. Um, but I guess we'll just do a prediction. Um, and I think that even though it's gone, you know, win loss, win loss, and now they're technically due a win, Fiorentina, if that form carries on, um, I do see us nicking this. I think last season we it was a really good game between uh, us and Fiorentina at their place. It was the one where we came from two one down to win three two, mm-hmm. um, and I can see it being like that again because I'm still not massively confident uh, in terms of keeping clean sheets. Um, so I, I can anticipate them scoring and Vlahovic has got 10 goals in 12 games so he's flying confidence wise and I'm sure he'd love to score against us to once again prove that um, you know he should she should be playing for a bigger club um, but I'll say we'll win 2-1 yeah you know I just said I'm, I'm not very confident and I'm nervous which is all true um, but my score prediction is going to contradict all of that hmm. um, because I think we're going to win 3-1 I, I think we're definitely going to concede um, Tatu Rushanu's gotten in, in really good form, you know, props to him. However, after the break, I don't know, maybe, maybe it drops off a little bit. We, we don't know what his, um, I guess, carryover is like after a break like that. You know, does he stay in top form? Does he kind of sit back, get comfortable with it? I, I, I don't know. Um, but without any of their defenders being starters, I think that really opens us up for goals. And, and I do think Rebic is eager for, for, for some goals. He's been out for a while. And now that he's back in full fit, I think it'll be. Rebic City, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. He's going to score Rebic, a lot. Rebic season. Yeah, there you go. Um, let's do some questions then and hope that we're both right in predicting a win there. Um, I'll try to get through as many of these as we can. Um, so the, the first question comes from Yaza and, and he asks, oh, it's more of a statement than a question, um, AC Milan B team that could play in the third tier league or maybe second tier. Now, uh, reading between the lines of what he's saying there, I think um, he's suggesting that Italian football adopts a similar strategy to what the uh, Bundesliga have and to what La Liga clubs have, where they have reserve teams that are playing in the lower divisions. I know in Bundesliga, you've got Dortmund and Bayern, second teams playing in the third division. They're not allowed to get promoted any higher than that, um, even though I think one year Bayern did finish top of the third division or something, which weren't allowed to go up. Um, I, I think it's probably the same in Spain. Um, I thought they were allowed to play in the second division. I just didn't think it was. I thought first was against the rules. Maybe I'm no, wrong. No, it's, it's the top two in Germany, definitely. It might be different in Spain. I don't okay. know if anyone's ever got that that high up. Um, but 
it's an interesting concept and you can certainly point to the success of the two national teams, Spain and, and Germany, um, mm-hmm. since since it was implemented and say that it has actually probably done some good for those clubs and for those countries developing the talent. I'm just massively opposed to it. Maybe this is me speaking as like a, a your traditional old-fashioned like football fan who lives in England, but I, I just can't imagine it. There's been all kinds of of controversy about this cup competition that we have in this country called the Papa John's Trophy for me. And it's the it's the third and fourth tier teams, but they also mix in academy teams from the Premier League, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some really bizarre scorelines in it. Like sometimes the academy teams will walk over, but a lot of time it's men against boys, and it's like five nil to the yeah. to the to the fourth division team against like Man United's academy. Mm-hmm. And that's when you realise there is still a big big uh, difference between a team of fully grown men and a team of players who are mostly going to be 19 and 18. Because remember, if these players are good enough at 18, 19 years old, they're probably going to be in and around the first team anyway. So it's right. not necessarily like they'd definitely be in these reserve sides. Um, and our Primavera is shit. So to imagine that they'd somehow be in the third division is probably wrong. If they had to start at the bottom of the pyramid, they're probably like a fifth division level team. Um, they're that bad at the moment. Yeah, I mean, those are basically exactly what I was going to say is where does our Primavera stack up? It's probably even worse. We're talking like a Serie D, you know, or a non-league at this point. Like it's, they're not a very good team. So I don't know. I mean, I like the idea that they get real professional game time, but then it's like, does Serie D experience really translate to Serie A experience versus just being on a youth team where at least we know the, the emphasis is on development and not results? Because once you're playing in a professional league, be it Serie D, Serie C, whatever, the goal is to win, and that's what you're expected to do. So then it's not so much the youth players getting development, it's um, signing in you know, old aging people sometimes. Like there, There's some backup teams that have really old players, and it's unnecessary. It's, uh, you know, it's nice for them to continue their career later on, but it, it doesn't make any sense for, for us, especially if we're using it as a feeder team. But now the emphasis on it is you have to win games, so you're going to bring in experienced players. I mean, I don't want to, I don't know. I'm trying to think of who it would be a good example, but like you would bring down a player who's decent, but at the end of their career, who could still do a number in, in those lower divisions. Like when we had Nexus, you know, his last season, he probably could have been shipped to like a, a Milan B in Serie D and, and done done bits there. But like, who does that help? You know, it, it, yeah, it does, right? yeah. so I, I'm kind of, I'm against it. I don't think it's necessary. It's an interesting idea if, if you know, we're wanting to look up, philosophical changes to how the Italian football pyramid works. Um, but it's got to be done right. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I think the Primavera still does, um, as a league, the Primavera still does quite a lot of good. Um, it's just we're looking at it as victims of the system, but really it's just because we have a shit team and a shit coach. That's yeah. sadly it. Um, next question. Uh, Farino asks, do Milan need to get another central midfielder in January? Should Kessie leave? Or do they stick it out and lose him for free at the end of the season with a potential Scudetto win? Um, you go first. I think it depends on his renewal. If he renews, or if he doesn't renew, then yeah, we're going to sign someone in January and we're going to let him stick around you know, for, for the end of the season and we'll just get, we'll do the same thing. We'll tap up a player on six months left, get a free transfer in. Um, then it's like for like over the summer. But if he does go for certain in January, which I think... Spurs might be the only club that could actually do it, you know, signing him right now, knowing that he's on the end of his deal um, with Conti being in there. He probably has a lot of guarantees and I know that's a player he would like and he knows it'd be cheaper than normal because it's six months left. So I could see that happening um, and guess he could get the money his agent's asking for there. So I could see that happening. And at that point, we absolutely replace him. There's no way we we don't, you know, like, like you said, the transfer strategy is necessary transfers and like for like swaps. If anyone leaves, someone comes in. So, yeah. If uh, anything happens to Kessie this season, we'll bring someone in. Yeah, if there are actually a few teams that are queuing up for Kessie, um, and we learn of that, you know, through his through his agent or whatever, and it is genuine, um, we could use it to our advantage still by saying, mm-hmm. "Look, we will give priority to the club who comes with a good offer in January." I'm still not dead against uh, selling him in yeah. January. I know he's very important to us, but. Surely it becomes surely the economic outweighs the 
Because if we lose him for free again, it reflects really badly on us. And that's what we're just sleepwalking towards at the moment. Yeah. And it, if we can even get 10, 15 million, which is a fraction of his market value, but we say to Spurs, if you bid that, then you can get him early and you'll beat the competition in doing mm-hmm. so. They might bite on that. The problem is, though, who's going to buy a player that can't play for the entire month of January? That's a fair point as well. You know, just sign yeah. him early and then finish your season because at that point, four months, you know, what, do, you, do you need him? He's not going to give you the full half of the season. He's going to give you the tail end of it. At that point, your starters are already de- decided. You know, you, you're already set in your ways. You Your league table placement's only going to shift so much at that point anyway. So it's like, do you need to add that player? I mean, if they're in a title race, which Spurs aren't, mm. then then maybe. Um, if, if Conte can do some magic with what he has right now and get him, you know, into fourth place, third place, uh, fighting for that second, first spot, then maybe I could see him making the move and try to do some magic that way. But it's not like Conte has immediate impact on players. You know, he he takes time to implement his ways because he's a very interesting personality and that's hard for, for players to adjust to. Some like it, some hate it. And, you know, you saw it with Christian Eriksen when when he signed him from Spurs to, to enter. He did awful. He was frozen out and, and Conte publicly was slating the guy. And then all of a sudden it finally clicked. It just took like six or seven months. Mm. And then he was a, a world beater for the second half of the season. But if that's what it's going to take with Kessie, who's coming from a guy like Pioli, who's not that, that personality yeah, at all, yeah. it might take some time. Mm. And I think that's what we're going to see. So I, I don't think it happens. I think he finishes the season here. Yeah, I think that's what we're heading towards. Um, and it's all in the name of principle, really. Um, but for a club that did want to sign him, you could argue it's almost the same as signing a player on deadline day because AFCON will run until like February 5th. Mm-hmm. So there's a few days between the end of the transfer market. and the, But it's if he comes back with fatigue, um, it's certainly something that they'll be considering. Um, McLean Wright asks for the... Or it could be McLean. Uh, right, as for an overview of the stadium project and where we currently stand with it, um, we actually don't talk too much about it because Italian bureaucracy is remarkably frustrating and this is no different. Um, it's been a nightmare trying to push through the stadium project, but it seems like we've finally uh, made some positive ground with it. There was council elections that delayed things. Um, Giuseppe Sala got re-elected as mayor and that's really good news for us because he's now fully in favour of the project. Um, there's a few key points that the council and the clubs didn't see eye to eye on, and that was sort of the the volume in terms of you know the uh, space that they, they were allowed to develop in, uh, what they were going to do with the existing stadium, uh, the sustainability, the funding of the project. All those doubts now seem to have been resolved. It's been passed as public interest, which is good. Um, so it's moving forward. But now the clubs have accepted, as in to CEO confirmed that uh, it probably won't be open until 2027. So we're still looking at over half a decade until we get this new stadium. Got a question then on that, like how much patience do Elliot have? Are they going to be here for another six years? I don't think so. I think they'll be gone way before that. And we know Inter's owners are going to have to change because you know they're now like 800 million in debt. Yeah. Um. The the back half that's not sustainable, and and the more that it drags on, you start to think they're going to bail out of the funding side of this. You know what's funny oh, about Inter, and this is it's relevant to the stadium, but just kind of quotes from um, earlier this week and then today, the PIF person who just bought Newcastle was saying we looked at Inter, we looked at Milan, but you know the league's a mess, we don't want to touch it. Well, then the the director of Serie A came out and said we have eight foreign investors, seven American, one Chinese, like. You know, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, we're great. But that Chinese investor that they just mentioned is almost a billion dollars in debt. They're yeah. tanking a club. They're going to murder it. And the seven Americans are all lower lower tables, you know, eighth mm. and below. I think Fiorentina is the best one right now. And, and ours, not obviously, good. <laughs> American, ours being American owners that took over the oh, duh, us. by chance. Took, right. Took well, we only got chance, it because of foreign design. owner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because a foreign um, owner... Uh, failed so interesting comments yeah. that i mean i think it was amanda stavely who said it and obviously she's got close ties to the pif group who took over newcastle and, and they said that they looked at buying both milan clubs as you mentioned and they said that the the um i think it was the structure of the league is a disaster mm-hmm. she used the word disaster and obviously he's taken offense to that and said well you were you had the choice between buying newcastle or buying milan or inter um we can say that she likes small cars and not f1 cars which is 
I mean, if that's the kind of attitude that we're going to have, rather than taking you know some some criticism on board and realizing that Syria does not look like a very investable league, he's chosen to have a little bit of a dig yeah. back and wind up a load of Newcastle fans as well. That says a lot about how backwards the league. It's all things need to change. <clears throat> the TV rights deals, uh, the revenue that's allowed to come in. Um, that financially it's so far behind. Newcastle are a more investable club than either of the Milan clubs. And if you'd have said that 10 years ago, you know, you'd been laughed at. Um, but that's a sad state of affairs that we're in mm-hmm. at the moment. Um, yeah, you look at, um, there There was a chart that showed like how much each Premier League club or the, the top clubs could spend um, and still be within FFP regulation. Spurs could spend half a billion pounds in one window and not with without making any sales at all and still be within FFP. You know, Chelsea was a quarter billion, you know, Man United was like 300 billion. Like all these Premier League clubs are are dominating that aspect because the league has ran so much better than than anyone else. You know, and so so for the director of Serie A to sit here and be like we're F1 cars, they're they're voxels or whatever he said like big difference, man. You know, they they're the F1 cars, you know. A relegated side making more money than than Syria champs. Like, come on, you know we, we need yeah, we we need to get rid of all this bureaucracy. Like our stadium project taking a, a decade and a half is absolutely insane. Everyone loves a sense hero, but look at the toilets. They're holes in the ground with the seat. You know, like the stadium's kind of a mess. It's it's beautiful, but it's a mess, and that's uh, you see it everywhere. You know, there was a big issue with Napoli Stadium for years as well. Um, Atlanta wasn't even allowed to play Champions League in their stadium because it's so bad. Like. Uh, you just you hear it every single day. Another club went bankrupt in Serie A or, or in the Italian pyramid. All the stadiums are all falling apart. The the guy needs to wake up. He needs to be slapped oh. in the face, and someone's got to tell him, like, "Look, we need to do something." It, it's not we're not the good guys in the story. Yeah, and and this 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 might be taken the wrong way, but Serie A needs more people in it in, in at the helm of football clubs like Gazidis, who have experience at clubs who were in the money league and mm-hmm. they know how clubs should be run to catch up um, because that's that's essentially what he can provide to us. He can give us his knowledge of, of what it takes to, mm-hmm. to kind of get into a similar ballpark as some of those teams in terms of venue. Um, but there's a lot of backward thinking CEOs, a lot of backwards thinking club presidents who are very happy to just sort of stay ambling along and, and that gap will keep on widening um, without a doubt. So... Yeah. Um, yeah, let's do a couple more. Timothy Weyer, oh, this is from Teo Diplas. Timothy Weyer for the right wing spot. Bring an American to Milan and give Milan more exposure to the US fan base. He's young and dominated against Mexico. I didn't see that game. Can you he confirm? Did. Yeah, yeah, he was probably man of the match. I mean, he had the assist that Pulisic came on late and um, Timmy threw, threw a beautiful cross that got the assist and that essentially won us the game. Um, obviously, we had a second one from Weston McKinney as well, but yeah, Wea was uh, star man of the game. And he... his his dad won Ballon d'Or with us, so you know you got an easy, easy sell there, plus the American market. And Americans love him. They're, they're crazy oh. about the kid. He's probably like fourth in the rank, I would say. It's, it's Pulisic, McKinney, Pepe, and then Wea. Pepe's another one who's been linked to with as well, hasn't he? He would be incredible. He's yeah, so good, man. If he's like 17 or 18... Things. There's yeah. a lot to great things to come with him. Um, way has I I knew him as more of a striker, but I'm guessing he's been doing well as a right winger then. Yeah, he started off as a striker, um, and and I think he might still play striker in France. I'm not sure, mm. but yeah, he's uh he's good. I like this him. is where I can give my uh, really really shit transfer exclusive. Um, so this is a treat. Uh, he shares an agent with Mohamed Simakam, who I spoke to quite a lot when. Um, he was obviously looked like he was going to be signing for us, but then didn't uh, through the whole knee injury debacle. Um, and yeah, he's also Timothy Weyer's agent. And uh, randomly, probably a couple of weeks ago, he sent me a video and it was Timothy Weyer starring for some new balance shoot. Um, and I thought that was a bit strange. So I just sort of replied courteously and said, oh, a great video and um, hopefully he'll end up at Milan one day like his dad. Um, and he sent that the, the praying hands emoji. So... Who knows what that means? Maybe yeah. that means that if, if they did come in, then he would be more than open to it. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Right, uh, Jake, that Milan fan asks, are you surprised at how our home forms has improved with the fans present? I'd have thought that a packed stadium would pile the pressure on such a young, inexperienced squad, but they're still killing it. 
Um, that was one of the. That was definitely one of the things that was talked about while we were on our run. Was to mm-hmm. wait until the fans are back. Yeah, and and I said that as well that I was nervous about it. But going into this season, I was a lot less nervous about it than I was last season thinking about it. Simply oh. because of how last season ended, we finished second. You know, the the boys are riding high. The fans are going to be very positive towards us, and that's what we've seen. You know, even even when things haven't gone our way, and remember, we've only had two draws outside of all all wins, so it's not like things have gone bad. But even when it is bad for us, we're we're still getting supported from the fans. So if the fans eventually turn on us, then then yeah, we might see some difficulties. But for now, it's it's helping. It's great, and I'm happy. Yeah. Um. I- similar to, to what I've said for a long time, uh, when things are going well, there is no better fan base to play in front of and mm-hmm. they will support everybody. Um, when things are difficult, it's an incredibly tough place to play. There was nothing to suggest coming into this season that you know the fans were going to be negative or pile too much pressure on. Um, if anything, they're very appreciative for what this team's done, um, albeit in their absence. Uh, and they were always going to come back and support and encourage. And I think the fans have been absolutely fantastic this season. Um and that's when it's been building up, obviously, in terms of the amount of fans that we're allowed. Once we're allowed a full house again, um, that's you know it's going to be fantastic. Um, but I could understand some of the worries if we had have missed out on the Champions League. You know, if that Atalanta game hadn't gone the way it had gone, um, and it's a case of here we go again. By the start of this season, it might have been a different story. Mm-hmm. Um, but even like in that Hellas Verona game when we were two 0 down at San Siro. Um, when you're thinking normally the fans would be right on the team's back, sort of jeering every misplaced pass, they sensed that something could change. Um, yeah. And by the end, the atmosphere was absolutely incredible, you know. Um, and and hopefully the players, kick, you know, take those those, um, those moments and those memories as confidence. And and the more that they get used to playing in front of a crowd like that, you know, the better they're going to be for it. Um. Rohit Rajiv asks, do you see Milan switching to a 4-3-3 at some point? Um, no. Maybe. Uh, no I don't. I, I don't see why we're, we would change anything up. I mean, it's it's working. Everything we've tried so far is working. I know in, in some, you know, part, some plays we do move that. We have a very fluid lineup. Um, but I, I think our concrete formation is the 4-2-3-1. Um, yeah, it, it changes in actuality on the pitch, but how we're going to line up, how the official lineup is going to be. I don't see it changing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we, the, and Rohit knows this well, obviously, just the tactical analysis for us. Uh, this idea that we place a uh, fixed 4-2-3-1 at all times is is very outdated now anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're really hybrid with our systems. We shift based on game situations. We have a different formation for defending as we do to attacking. You know, we're different in transition. Um we're a lot more fluid aside than, than the media like to give us credit for when they say Milan are nailed with this 4-2-3-1. Um, substitutions within games, we've switched to a 4-3-3 at times by bringing off the attacking midfielder for Krunic or for another midfielder. Um, so it's not beyond the realms of possibility. In terms of us changing our formation altogether um, and it being very obvious that we're doing that, maybe if we went with like a, a Benacer, Tonali and then um, a box to box midfielder, if we signed one like Renato Sanchez, I, I don't know, maybe then you start to look at it. Um, but uh, for the time being, no, I, I think Brahim's too important to this team, mm-hmm. he's always going to be the designated number 10. Yeah, um, when when Brahim was out and Kroonch was playing, um, I, I said it a couple times, I thought we were actually going to be playing more of a, a 4 3 1 2, um, mm-hmm. which a lot of people could argue is a 4 3 3 with like a, a, a false nine or something like that, and that's kind of what we saw. So, uh, you know, it's I think it happens plenty during the games, but I, I just don't think it'll be ever on the starting lineup. You know, not, at least not under Peely. I think the starting lineup's always going to come out four three or four two one. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, <laughs> these numbers yeah. messing me up. Yeah, um, I think the starting lineup's always going to look the same as far as the formation, but in game, yes, it changes often. Mm-hmm. Um, I will ask one more, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, from who'd roll it like that? Um, should we start to give some Primavera talents like Kirkes, Traore, Roback, and others playing time for the first team earlier? Um, I see this talked about a lot. Like, why can't we play Kirkes instead of Balotore? Um, why isn't Roback getting a, a go? Um, you're really throwing them in the deep end there. You know, they're in a Primavera team that's getting spanked 5 1 by Hellas Verona, and you think it's a good idea to chuck them in the deep end uh, in a game like 
the derby or even if you mean like a Coppa Italia game, these are still teenagers who would be playing against fully grown adults. Um, and Kirkes is a great talent, don't get me wrong, but he's 17 years of age and he was playing in Hungary last year. His time will come, but it's probably not for another three or four years. And I'm sorry to disappoint people if they think any differently. Trior is a little bit different. Uh, he'd already made his Serie A debut for Parma against us, funnily enough, um, when he was 16 years old. There's clearly some kind of acceleration process with him. Um, whether he's just deemed to have peaked a little bit earlier, I don't know. Um, but again, I still think he's quite a way off because we could do with a right winger and yet he's still not being talked about as potentially being promoted, you know, even for a few minutes off the bench. Um, same with Roback. I think, the, as I say, these are all teenagers. They're just going to need a bit of time. They're maybe going to need a couple of loan spells and we have to be patient with them. Calabria, you know... It, when he was thrown in there, it was sort of out of necessity in that 2014-15 season. Mm -hmm. And we're lucky that he flourished. Donnarum, you could sort of say the same. Um, it, you're not always going to be like that. And the more that we can protect... But remember, them that Primavera side that they all were on together, I think won the league, did it not? I think they were they actually the good. Okay. That, that's yeah, they won, they won the, the trophy, cup. yeah. But uh, they weren't bad. Like uh, The Primavera side we have now is awful. So bad. You know, it's it, it, please awful, change awful. the coach if anyone's yeah. listening. Let if Pioli you... pick the new manager so that they can mirror each other. Then you could make the argument that the players could interchange if they're playing He's the same system. But, yeah. but they're not even playing the same system and the Primavera one isn't working. So it's like... It's, I, tough. I don't, it's yeah. tough because there is some talent there. And I think, I think nowadays academies are more geared towards progressing the individual than you know, getting team results. The mm -hmm. fact that Roma are top of the Primavera League perhaps says it all. I, I don't think they have the best squad at all when you look at the individuals, but because they focus on being more results driven. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, we are very much just kind of like trying to, to churn out talent still. Um, there are some, yeah, as I say, there are some talented players in there. Um, they're not being given much of a chance to succeed at the moment because of the results and... Um, yeah, something needs to change on that front, I think. Um, yeah, let's wrap it up, shall we? Um, yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Oh, we've gone over an hour again. Um, my bad on that. Uh, but thank you if you made it this far. Uh, we'll be back in a week's time, of course, with um, the recap of the Fiorentina game and looking ahead to the next Champions League action. Uh, but I've been your host, Ollie Fisher. You can find me on Twitter at Ollie Fisher, as you can see on the screen. Uh, AJ. Yeah, you know, uh, before we start recording, all I said I could definitely keep this one under forty minutes. Uh, that that never happens. No. Nope. Um, but it's always a pleasure. Um, it's 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 fun. I wish, uh, you know, the internet in England wasn't under construction right now, <laughs> preventing John from joining us. And um, but it's all good. You know, we're here and we'll be back again next week. So thank you everyone for listening and um, Target Forty Five. Yeah, thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in a week. Ante, eccolo Ante Ante in area di rigore, Ante Ante, Ante Ante, Ibra, gol! Vediamo se è buono, ce l'ho da buono, ce l'ho da buono, ce l'ho da buono!